Okay, so we've got a few nerves left. Um, we're not going to worry about them too, too much because uh, they're pretty straightforward. First of all, the um, likelihood of having problems that are, are actual damage to the nerves um, is, is somewhat minimal, uh, traumatic damage, that is. So, um, but there, there are conditions where, um, for, for example, the glossopharyngeal and the vagus are going to go on the fritz. And they're, they're going to go on the fritz, for example, in oh. a disease such as amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, uh, the uh, motor neurons that innervate uh, the upper airway muscles are, uh, can be affected. They frequently are. In fact, one of the uh, first presenting symptoms in, in amyotrophic lateral sclerosis or, or Lou Gehrig's disease can be a dysarthria or a dysphagia. These are this is a common way for it to first present. The functions that are critical when one's looking at the glossopharyngeal and the vagus are dysarthria, dysphagia, a disruption of the gag reflex. So that's not hugely uh, diagnostic because, uh, as I said before, about 30% of people don't have a gag reflex. Another bunch of people have an overactive gag reflex. They have a gag reflex that's not even uh, doesn't require a somatosensory stimulus to elicit. You can just look at something and gag. Uh, so th it's not it's not a hundred percent useful in in diagnosing um, a, a problem. But on the other hand, the cough reflex, which is also known as the laryngeal adductor reflex, and this is the the reflex that keeps uh, foreign matter out of the trachea. The gag reflex is keeping foreign matter out of the throat. So pretty high up out of the pharynx, at the pharynx level. But the uh, laryngeal adductor reflex keeps things out of the trachea. And that's important because if there's penetration in, into the trachea, uh, foreign matter can actually make its way down into the lungs. And aspirating uh, foreign matter into the lungs is, is, a, uh, is a bad thing. So uh, those are the things that one has to worry about with um, the glossopharyngeal and the um, the glossopharyngeal and the vagus. When you get to the spinal accessory nerve, there will be a um, very predictable deficit in the ability to shrug and the ability to turn the head. Um, the, a common uh, symptom uh, that unfortunately is caused by uh, caused by often caused by surgery, um, is a winged scapula. The, the spinal accessory nerve gets tip, uh, ticked, gets a little bit uh, damaged, and there's a, a protrusion of the, of the scapula from the back. Um, it doesn't happen a ton, but it can happen. And finally, there's the uh, hypoglossal, and this is uh, the nerve that's going to control the tongue. Again, it doesn't go on the fritz too, too often, but it's going to... Uh, the, the tongue will deviate. It will not, for example, if one tries to stick the tongue out, um, it will not go straight out because half of the tongue muscles are not working. Okay, so what have we learned? Let's think about the, the, the message that we got from the cranial nerves. I want to distinguish a, a quintessential cranial, cranial nerve problem. And, and the two cr ones that I would say are quintessentially cranial nerve are um, Bell's palsy with the facial nerve. It's this weird uh, accumulation of symptoms. And the in an oculom oculomotor palsy, where you have, a, an, again, a particular uh, constellation of symptoms. Now, let us distinguish that from two other possibilities. One is a very peripheral uh, disease. And so an example of that is uh, chronic external ophthalmoplegia. In chronic external ophthalmoplegia, all of the extraocular muscles and the levator palpebrae all are damaged. They are damaged. It is a mitochondrial disorder. They all don't work. And so the, the person will um, cannot move their eyes. Uh, they have problems with uh, ptosis. And to change their gaze, they can still change their gaze, they change their gaze by turning their head, but their eyes are fixed within their head, okay? And this typically affects children, so the children don't, they've grown up that way, they don't particularly realize it, the parents realize that they're never moving their eyes. So that's something that we can't get from a cranial nerve, okay? You would have to, you would have to lose 
three, four, and six on both sides. So it is not, that is not a cranial nerve type of presentation. That is a peripheral presentation. That is a muscle problem. Now, let's go into the central nervous system. If we had a central uh, n uh, nervous problem, we're going to look at two, where I'm going to consider two. One is where you, uh, you have a preservation of, um, of, of near vision, okay? One can ch change the fixation from a far target to a near target and still get uh, proper vision when looking at the near target, but you have no pupillary light reflex. This is a dissociation. So could that be a problem with cranial nerve three? Well, no, because in one situation, you're uh, producing the near triad, including uh, constricting the pupil. And um, in, in the other situation, when there's light uh, being produced, you are not constricting the pupil. So that is context specific. That is a deficit that is context specific. The, the pupil constricts during near vision, but not in response to light. That could not be a cranial nerve problem. Let's look at one other one. Let's say that you can, uh, you can laugh in response to a joke, but you can't laugh in response to a command. In other words, a physician is examining you, says, could you please smile? And you can't do that, but when they tell you a joke, you give a nice big smile. That, again, is a place where there is context to the deficit. That can only derive from a central lesion. It cannot derive from a cranial nerve lesion. Okay, so that's what, that's what I want you to have gotten from this series of lectures on cranial nerves. And we are now going to move in to the brainstem.